Uh, good morning, yes. Yeah. So for our next session, we're going to be talking about the warning signs, um, how investment can stop the next pandemic. And joining our panel will be Dr. Sarah Alatari, advisor for biotechnology and healthcare at the Ministry of Investment, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Also on our panel will be Dr. Frederick Christensen, the Deputy CEO of CEPI, the Center for Epidemiology Preparedness Innovation. And joining us live from London would be Joe Sorrell, um, the Managing Director, Europe, the Middle East, East Asia, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Thank you, welcome to the, to, um, to the panel and to the FI Institute um, Investment Conference. So I just wanted to start off with, um, just wanted to say, Joe, can you hear us? I can hear you just fine, thank you. All right, thanks a lot, welcome. I hope everything is, is fine in London and it's not too cold there. We've got very sunny climbs here in Riyadh. Wish I could be with you. <laughs> Good. Um, so I just wanted to start off our session when we're talking about how investment can stop the next pandemic. And sometimes um, I had a brief chat with Dr. Sarah Alatari that sometimes you, investors always tell you that this is what we think you should invest in. But I always like to throw a challenge to investors and say, okay, would you use your money to invest in this particular, particular technology? So I know probably just starting off um, might be a tough question for you, Dr. Alatari. So if I gave you a million dollars, what technology in the health space would you invest in and why? So it's not just tough, I think it's impossible to answer. <laughs> but uh, first, let me start off by saying thanks, uh, Lamine, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sincere honor and, and privilege to be uh, speaking on the FII stage and amongst an esteemed group of, of panelists. Uh, so I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Um, I think what you're asking me is just a really fun and creative way of saying what are your FDI priorities, right? Your healthcare priorities. What is the next big idea or the next sort of disruptive innovation? Yeah. Uh, and I'm not going to pick one thing, but I will tell you that I'm very bullish on platform technologies, right? Um, and we've seen the uh, ascension and the rapid advancement of these platform technologies as a direct consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so these are, you know, biomolecular platforms, but also, you know, digital platforms that leverage deep machine learning and AI to enable broad and efficient healthcare solutions. Um, on the biomolecular platform side, we've seen mRNA platforms, right? take center stage as, as uh, vaccine modalities, but their applications, of course, transcend that and are now being explored for things like cancer therapies and uh, as therapeutics for rare diseases like cystic fibrosis and, and, and other yeah. uh, uh, unmet clinical needs. And so the nice thing about platform technologies is that they're versatile, they can be ubiquitous, um, and they're iterative, right? So, so they're based on a, a, a systematic method of, of relying on prior knowledge and then being able to continuously improve and update that platform based on uh, new developments, right? So it's, whether it's optimizing an mRNA sequence or other sorts of things. And so they allow us to respond very rapidly to new threats, right, as we've seen with COVID. Yeah. And then, of course, the digital side is... You know, we've seen the, 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 the ways in which AI and other smart algorithms have um, enabled things like, you know, virtual care and remote monitoring. Uh, but these digital technologies are also integral to the business models of platform-based companies, right? So, they, so they, they, they assist across the value chain in terms of optimizing drug design, uh, optimizing, uh, you know, clinical trial grade material, and then even downstream uh, pr production, so drug product design and, and uh, downstream manufa advanced manufacturing processes. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot. So just to conclude, so you, you, would, well, you would advise people to invest in platinum technology, but if, for platinum technology, do you see any kind of, what are, the, are there any like dangers to do with security, obviously cybersecurity? Um, and how you how you managing or mitigating that? Are you investing in other companies that are also looking at that aspect as well? Yeah, so I think you know you have to look at IT infrastructure holistically, right? Mm -hmm. So um, data governance, legislation, and standards is very important. There was a, 
a lot of anxiety after the completion of the Human Genome Project yeah. as to you know, how people would use and, and utilize and manipulate these data. Of course, I think we're well beyond uh, that stage in terms of uh, the way that we perceive the threat of data. Yeah. But I still think IT architecture and capacity and being able to strike that balance between you know, um, having comprehensive data sets that can be used in a cross-institutional basis to leverage you know, epidemiology, yeah. but at the same time maintain uh, a reasonable level of, of national security and, and patient uh, uh, anonymization and those sorts of things. Okay, thanks a lot, Sarah. Um, my next question will be directed to you, um, Dr. Frederick. So can you please tell us from the incredible work that's been going on at CEPI, um, what you think governments should invest in to sustain um, and have a more robust health system for their population, especially in light of the pandemic and, and also preparing to avoid um, a devastating effect of a pandemic. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you for uh, the invite and, and yeah. for being here. Uh, My pleasure. I'll, I'll align very much with what Sarah's just commented on in terms of, I think the short answer is, you know, research and development and innovations are still very much needed. Um, I think the longer reflection is that, you know, as a public health physician and economist, I've been struck by how this pandemic has demonstrated the interconnectedness between science, health, uh, finance, yeah. um, and global development, and security. And, um, you know, on the one hand, we've seen a, a really a revolution in vaccinology um, with the mRNA vaccines, but also other platform technologies uh, like, um, you know, vector-borne yeah. um, vaccines coming out of, uh, for example, Oxford-AstraZeneca collaboration, which has now been given to close to a billion people on the planet. So these platforms have been, you know, tremendous achievements. Um, but on the other hand, we're also seeing the amazing inequity. You know, today, about 50% of the world's population has received one dose of a vaccine. In the low and middle income countries, it's less than 3%. So it's clearly also demonstrated the, the you know, failures of the global system at uh, uh, sort of the macro level. Yeah. And we are having a sort of a twin track recovery. And I think we need to take some important lessons from this, and that is that investing in global health security and global health um, countermeasures like vaccines, diagnostics and, and medicines is also an investment in national security and in regional security. And um, of course, you know, CEPI is focused on, has been focused on the R&D part, and, and we see that R&D and innovation are source because if we can have the technologies ready based on platform technologies when the next big outbreak comes yeah. then we can you know stop it in its tracks before it becomes too big and i think mers is a good example you know that's a disease which you are far too familiar with here and if we have a, another coronavirus that comes anywhere in the world but with you know, the lethality of MERS, which is about 30%, yeah. and the transmissibility of COVID-19, then this was a nice dress rehearsal. Yeah. And we need to be ready, unfortunately, for those kinds of scenarios. So um, um, that's the longer answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an interesting point, because one of the things, you know, sadly about um, the human psyche is that we actually prefer we don't like to prepare for things until it hits us. So, I mean, that's one of the things I'm a little bit concerned maybe in the future, for the future generation, that, okay, we have this pandemic, but I, I feel that there might be this kind of, you know, detriment to say, oh, well, we, we, deal, we dealt with it, we, we developed a vaccine in, in, in 12 months. So if it happens next time, maybe we have the time to do it in two or three months, but then mm. sometimes I think that's the danger. The, the human psyche just wants things to happen and then before they act, and I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges to get people to prepare ahead of time, whether it's, you know, for example, you know, we talked earlier on our previous talk about, you know, the last vaccine for TB was 100 years ago, and it's only effective for five to 10 years, but then they said about, um, about 1.8 billion people in the world have TB, but it's latent mostly, but no one's doing anything about it, so, and it could, be, it could be potentially become a pandemic, 
but it's like, you know, if it doesn't affect this part of the world, we're not actually interested. So I think that's probably one of the challenges to like give that kind of shake up call to governments and say, okay, you saw what happened, you lost, I don't know, um, you said about what, five trillion dollars was lost from the, uh, the global mm -hmm. economy. I hope that next time or from now, we should start preparing ahead of time and not wait for the next five, 10, 15 years for another pandemic. Maybe I could speak out of turn just to add to this, which is um, last night I heard an interesting conversation which was about the potential bottoming out of the global economy, right? We got, in some ways, it's hard to say this because of the devastating toll that this virus has had, but the way I think of it is there's an analogy of when you dive into a pool, if you scrape your chin, the expression among lifeguards is you're an inch away from being a paraplegic, right? And I think that that is sort of the reality of yeah. what we faced with this pandemic. It, imagine if the mortality rate among under 10s was the same as it was among over 80 year olds. And we don't fully understand why it wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. Just take a moment to think about that and how deeply different this, this world would be. Mm. Yeah. And I think from that point of view, I think you know, 2022 is going to be a really important year for yeah. the world to try to get its act together to be better prepared. Because we have seen, you know, historically these cycles of panic and then mm. neglect. Mm. And we know that, you know, the world will move on and, you know, focus on other uh, yeah. also important topics. But we have so many lessons now that we can actually build on. Yeah. Uh, so if we don't use that opportunity, I think it's uh, a, lost, uh, a lost one. Yeah. And if I may, I'll just point to the fact that um, uh, with uh, FII and something called the Pan, uh, the Pandemic Action Network, yeah. there is a report out today on KSA's investments, um, also in CEPI. I mean, KSA was, during its G20 chairmanship in 2020, made some really important investments in you know, this global solution of COVAX, but yeah. also supported CEPI. Mm -hmm. So been a fantastic beacon for, for glo you know, global health preparedness. And this report looks at, you know, the value of those investments, both for national uh, security, but also regional and global. And uh, it's available on the website of FII from, from yeah. today. So. Yes, that's <laughs> good. I remember I was part of, um, part of that work. So I'm really happy that that work's actually been released and I look forward to reading the final version of that. Thanks a lot. Um, so Joe, can you hear us? Are you... We didn't want to neglect you. Joe? So maybe I'll, I'll proceed. I think we may, maybe we've lost Joe. So, um, so my next question is actually for you, Nathan. So using data science and medicine to help governments make informed decisions to mitigate examples, um, epidemics sounds very futuristic, but what's next? Yes, and I'd like to just echo some of the comments of the other panelists, which is this is a devastating event, but it's also an opportunity, right? This is an unusual opportunity for us to think about an ever-present and systemic risk that's like climate risk, mm -hmm. that's you know more important than cyber risk, and to address it, to have that energy. And, and Dr. Altari, I will completely agree in the platform technology, the role that technology companies have played in changing things and thinking of this as a platform, I think is, I completely agree with it. And I think it's useful for all of us to take a moment and try to imagine a world very different from our current world where we, were, where we detected and managed COVID quickly and extinguished it and try to imagine what that world looks like. And, and I think that there's some features of a platform technology that would support the, that, that sort of world. One of them is if you think about COVID, it, it, was, it occurred, the response was at human pace. Right? And what we really need is machine pace. Right? It can't be the data is informing committees and committees are having discussions. We need something that is capable of moving at the pace of machines. The second point I would make is think about the time it took us to, to ramp up to being able to have appropriate diagnostics and to test and manage this. Right? In my country, the United States, which arguably invested more in pandemic preparedness than any country in the world, we, it took us many months to be able to have appropriate diagnostics, even to identify COVID in the population. We need always on systems. 
that are capable of monitoring uh, the whole range of possible pandemics, known, <clears throat> unknown, unknown, unknown. And those systems need to be always on constantly. They can't be turned on when you have an epidemic. The other thing is there's a set of silos. The ability of policymakers to talk to vaccine manufacturers, to deal with public health individuals and local clinics, is there's no interoperability there. So what we need is the capacity for the same set of data, the same set of models, the same monitoring information to be able to be used in different ways by people making policies. And they need a, a common language to speak to each other and that that hasn't, hasn't been the case in previous, you know, in this, in this particular epidemic. And I think if we do do those things, the way that I think of our response is a little bit like a sledgehammer. The way that we use quarantining, the way that we use lockdowns, uh, probably even the way that we deploy vaccines is a sledgehammer. But if you had a world that had this interoperability that was always on, you could move to being a scalpel, right? Exactly what population does need to be um, quarantined and who needs to, you know, what is the vaccine needs and diagnostic needs. And I do think that uh, we have a once in a lifetime, once in a generation, you know, maybe once in a century opportunity to focus the world's attention on the tremendous needs and, frankly, markets that are going to be associated with these risks and to come up with the kind of technology that can address yeah. them. I, mean, I think that's a good point. Just pointing the last point, Nathan, um, you talked about, in fact, when we were developing the AI robotics um, roadmap at the FI Institute, we came across a company that were doing some really innovative work in terms of d developing algorithms to inform governments about when they should have, when people should wear masks, where should they ma wear masks, who should be vaccinated. But just another point that came to my mind, um, maybe one of our earlier conversations, was the concept of you know, not having this one-size-fits-all approach, um, looking at molecular um, diagnostic. And I know Dr. Sarah is in, into this area. There's no like, you know, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not a scientist. I'm just, you know, I'm just innovative thinking. I'm thinking to myself, is there, even if it's like whether it's the mRNA vaccine, is there, is there a way that technology can be used to develop vaccines that are specific for different types of genetics, for example. I'm just, I'm just thinking, this is an out-of-the-box question. I'm not sure whether um, Dr. Sarah wanted to answer that or Nathan, you had. So, I mean, yeah, so for, uh, first of all, I completely agree, especially with the point on always on systems and especially having healthcare capacity that can deal with so these sorts of surges that we experience with pandemics while also being able to maintain, uh, you know, essential services, right, for, yeah. for patients. Um, so, so what you're just what you're describing is exactly the, the the essence behind platform technologies is whether they're, you know, emerging microbiome platforms or genetic information driven platforms or, or viral vector mRNA, um, and then and then you apply those and and you modulate and you iterate based on rising demand or various needs. But I think I mean if we if we look at it as 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 a risk distribution, right? And in and investing, uh, uh, we, we tend to look at the kind of the average consequences of a risk distribution as what we think about, right? That's yeah. what typically makes the headlines. Um, but, but these events like pandemics or depressions, right, are the tail ends of this distribution. Uh, and, and that's what we need. So we need to invest in solutions that allow us to address these tail ends. Uh, and these will inevitably have spillover effects that allow us to address the entire spectrum of infectious disease risk, right? And so, you know, worst case scenario, you'll end up over investing in having fantastic primary healthcare systems and public health institutions. And yeah, you might over invest in, in vaccine res research and drug development, uh, uh, but that's not money gone, gone to waste, right? That yeah. will serve the purpose of just having a more robust foundation to address these risks when they come up, whether it's once in a hundred years or, or more frequently than, yeah. than, we, than we expect. Okay, thanks a lot. Mm. Joe, can you, I saw you came on and then you went off. I don't know whether you can hear us. I can hear you just fine. Okay, great. So, um, so my next question goes to you. So, I mean, the Gates Foundation works at the forefront of health challenges across the world. Um, what have you seen that has made you think, wow, I wish they had invested in that technology much earlier? Yeah, well, some of that has been covered. And, and first of all, I, I also want to acknowledge that it's uh, great to be here. And I'm sorry to not be with you in person. Um, 
I think some of the specific innovations, technology platforms have been noted uh, already yeah. and by, by some of the analysts. And I think RNA vaccine platforms is something that the foundation has been investing in for nearly a decade, even though many thought that RNA platforms weren't technically feasible. I'm glad that uh, uh, along with the foundation, others uh, stuck with it. And it has proven to be the backbone of the response on the vaccine side for this particular ec epidemic. Um, others on this panel will be better suited to talk about specific kinds of technologies. We're investing in, uh, in a range. We haven't talked about antivirals, some treatment options. We, we saw some great uh, progress uh, in the Merck um, product that was just announced and, and hopefully will be um, available in, in both uh, high income, low income settings in, in the near future. <laughs> Diagnostics, obviously, is. Uh, Another thing that I think looking back, we'll uh, ask ourselves if we invest enough in, in some of the diagnostics that could help uh, track and monitor and, and be part of a public health uh, solution in the future. You know, for me, as I'm listening, I'm also thinking about um, the, the role of governments and the, the role and the need for collective action. Uh, in this case, I'd say the world came up a bit short in terms of trying to work in a more cooperative, multilateral fashion. Um, Frederick talked about some of the disparities that we continue to see uh, and agonizingly persist in, in low-income countries. Um, I think the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia did a great job and, and using a forum like the, the G20 was able to get uh, not only uh, its own investments to things like CEPI and, and uh, Gavi's COVAX initiative, um, uh, better finance, but also uh, leverage other uh, actors into to doing the same. But, be that as it may, many countries did act in a much more uh, bilateral fashion. And I think that we also have to look at the uh, new innovations and in how we work together and respond uh, to, to crises like these in the future. Uh, I think we ought not give up on some of the things that uh, we need to do to collectively end this pandemic, or at least at this point, control the most acute phase of it. Uh, but it, 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 we also need to, as, as part of the stock take, uh, for COVID, think about how do we in the system improve our ability to, to act in a way that is going to, to uh, reflect our, our best interests and not act in these more uh, unilateral kinds of ways. Yeah. You know, for me, I think that uh, the appreciation of health is not just a, a nice to have, but as part of a national security strategy is one of those things that could elevate it. And I'm, I'm glad to see uh, Global Health uh, have such a prominent uh, place in the FII, in other fora, whether it's the Munich Security Conference, Davos, that uh, I think it is good to really talk about this. And I'm uh, glad people like Nathan have really also highlighted it in uh, that amazing uh, report that he uh, highlighted just before the session, uh, to really kind of uh, get people to really understand that investment in a more resilient system uh, uh, as an insurance policy, hopefully, but, but to have a better system of preparedness is also a kind of, um, is something that the governments need to really take much more seriously and think about the kinds of finance that are going to be needed to, to make it more flexible. So I, I'm also talking with governments. Um, we have uh, teams that are working on this U.S. reconciliation bill that has significant sums of, of, uh, of money that will go into, hopefully, a better, more prepared system in the future. Uh, here yesterday with the, the UK, the launch of its, um, or the release of its budget that thankfully increases investments in, in global health and, and R&D. Those are the kinds of investments that we're going to need to see from other countries um, to really make sure that, that uh, we are better prepared in the, in the future. All right, thanks a lot. I think you answered you answer one of my questions I was gonna share with you in terms of, you know, this um, worrying trend that took place over the last 18 months where people were dealing with a pandemic bilaterally. And I always say to people, well, it's called a pandemic because it crosses borders. It does not respect, you know, nations. And um, I think that's good that, that you mentioned that you're already working with some governments to try and tackle this multilaterally because that's how, you know, a pandemic should actually be dealt with, looking at it from a global um, connectivity because we're all integrated. It's all, we're all one world. and the disease does not discriminate, or the virus or the bacteria does not discriminate based on which country you're in. So I think, thanks for answering that question. So my next question um, actually is open to all of you, is you know, we've just experienced one of the worst pandemics in the history, but what has bothered many, many people 
was the fact that we were still using methods from you know 100 years ago. For example, you know when they had the Spanish flu, um, I think around about 100 years ago, they had the same measures: wear masks, they had quarantine, social distancing. And you fast forward to 100 years later, where we have all this fantastic technology, whether it's AI, robotics, blockchain, and we're so a lot more interconnected. Um, and people are saying, what new technologies are coming, or what technology be that already exists that we did not leverage enough to prepare and mitigate this, um, this pandemic. So I'll probably start off with you, Frederick. <laughs> yeah, so I think um, to answer that, I think it's helpful to sort of have a, an organizing principle or a goal to shoot for. And so when we were thinking of what we needed to invest in, what technologies, we said that this time around was fantastic. We had you know, 326 days, I think, from we knew what this virus was till we had actually the you know, first vaccines ready. Yeah. Um, we should have, as an organizing principle and a goal, that next time around, this should only take 100 days. Because if that had been the case, you know, we would not have had vaccines on December the 8th when there were 68 million cases in the world, but we would have had them on April the 20th with only 2.3 million cases. And you can imagine what impact that could have had on both number of lives that we've lost, which is you know, now close to 5 million that we know of, probably somewhere between 10 and 15 million in real time, and, and, and saved a lot of economy. But so concretely, I think the, um, we've already talked about the, the rapid response platforms. Yeah. There's one other aspect, which is to actually go through and think about the 25 virus families that we know can infect people and have prototype vaccines for each of those. Mm -hmm. um, and in many ways, that's what happened this time around, because thanks to the investment in both mRNA vaccines and in MERS, um, we were able to switch very quickly, uh, you know, this time. So, so that kind of approach, I think, is, is important. Yeah. And then I think um, innovations in manufacturing are going to be needed. You know, having smaller scale, cheaper manufacturing that can be closer to where outbreaks are and globally distributed. And ideally also have, you know, a network of these manufacturers sort of where you can, you know, as a global community, better uh, align. Because I think it's like Sarah was pointing to, there are so many positive spin-off effects of these kinds of investments yeah. um, that you can use these manufacturing sites for ordinary diseases in the other tail end of that uh, curve yeah. <laughs> when, you know, for, for endemic diseases as they're called, like yes. malaria and tuberculosis and other pieces, and, and then be able to switch them quickly. Um, uh, so those kinds of investments are also going to be really important. And, and you'll have spin-off effects on more general R&D. Um, yeah. You'll have spin-off effects in terms of uh, you know, remaining more secure for the next big outbreak. And we have to remember that there's also now with the ease of using these technologies, there's also an increased threat of man-made disease outbreaks yeah and so you know having these investments as you know security for from that perspective is also really important okay thanks actually i really like some of the points you mentioned um and what i liked especially um, and i'll direct i'll ask nathan to ask this diff next was where you talked about having a limited time to respond and setting kpis so for example if there's a record of oh um 10,000 people have just died from a particular disease in this village or this city what are we waiting for? And I want to go that directly now to Nathan. The same question I asked all of you, but I know that obviously when, when we developed the index with Metabiota, they have an AI algorithm. In fact, they picked up the, um, the coronavirus first before the WHO. So perhaps that's maybe that kind of technology, using that technology and ups, um, scaling it up so it's available faster. So over you to Nathan. So again, I think in our ideal world, we don't have to rely upon development of drugs and vaccines, right? We will have to do that, but we catch these things and manage them in a fundamentally different way, hopefully using technology. And I think that there, the, there is good news in terms of technology. 
Um, even in the last five years or so, molecular diagnostics have fundamentally changed in a way that permits us to imagine monitoring for new pandemics in a different way. And I think it's worth just taking a moment to talk about this. Mm -hmm. This is the field of cell-free nucleic acids. So if we wanted to understand all of the viruses in an individual, you would have to sample brain tissue, cerebrospinal fluid, nasopharyngeal swab. So it's basically impossible to know viruses pragmatically in individuals historically. Cell-free nucleic acids means that there's little bits of DNA, and this is the technology that's been used for liquid biopsies, for eliminating amniocentesis, for fetal diagnostics, and also for, ca for cancer diagnostics, now can identify microbes. So microbes from a little bit of blood can diagnose all the viruses within an individual. So you could imagine a system where there was molecular diagnostics that was in a closed loop optimal system with modeling. Yeah. So you're constantly modeling what's going on, you're sampling using these molecular diagnostics and you're identifying things quickly and responding to them. I just wanted to also address this sort of global local issue. Um, and I think this is one that's hard to, easy to get wrong, which is these are global phenomena and you need to be monitoring global events. But response is fundamentally a local phenomena, right? And, and the way that I increasingly think of it is these sorts of platform technologies that are using molecular diagnostics and modeling to monitor in an optimized way and respond kind of, again, with a scalpel rather than a sledgehammer. Um, and I do think that we can, you know, we can imagine a world in which, um, and I, I'll, make a, I'll make a prediction, I predict within the next, the, the near future, let's say five or ten years, that there is, let's say, a smart city or municipality that has the capacity to know virtually all the viruses in all of their citizens all the time. And if you imagine that world, and I think the technology permits it, technology that exists today, Right? Not that it's cheap, not that there's not risks associated with it, but we have the technology to imagine that. And if you imagine that world, the capacity to respond and extinguish events quickly and dynamically in a surgical way, rather than using the yeah. shotgun approach that we've had. Um, and I think that that is the world that we need to aim for. And I think technology has permitted that kind of uh, transformation in other sectors. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think it's these kinds of systems that will be you know, fundamentally necessary. Okay, so you heard it here at the Future Investment Initiative <laughs> Conference, <laughs> the prediction that within the next five to 10 years, there'll be a smart city in the world that can actually have all the data to manage um, the population's um, disease. Um, so over to you, Sarah, if you want to repeat the question. Uh, no, no, that's fine. Okay. Um, I, uh, I, I, I agree with that last point, and I think one of, the, one of the pillars that we think about in terms of pandemic preparedness and, and, and even what we as a Ministry of Investment can facilitate in terms of um, the different layers of preparedness is uh, bringing in the technology and the know-how to do exactly this, which is, you know, mapping the global virome and making sure that we have this repertoire of data that we can use and leverage uh, um, to prevent uh, future future outbreaks and future events, um, so so I couldn't agree more. And I think just on the point of collaborations, uh, again another uh, glass half full uh, uh, scenario out of this pandemic is that I, I really think that COVID has catalyzed conversations about expanding partnerships that that benefit all players, right? And so you know these synergies between biotech and pharma and academia and, and you know, platform companies and data providers, they've always existed. Um, but I think what COVID has done is that it has uh, accelerated the, the time and the attention and the capital that is devoted to these sorts of partnerships. And we've seen this even in the private-public private partnership space, yeah. right, between governments and research centers in the private sector. Um, so I'm very optimistic about how those will, will play out in, in the future, uh, um, and those stakeholder roles and responsibilities will facilitate a global level of, of responsiveness. On the, on the technology side, I think f for sure, you know, data, right, AI and smart algorithms 
for, for detection, early diagnosis, prevention, uh, uh, and all of the applications that we described. We've seen early seeds in, in various universities uh, 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 and, and, and various collaborations between universities and hospitals of this cutting edge research as a result of COVID. So things like, you know, tens of thousands of audio inputs to diagnose in a smart way uh, how a COVID cough sounds like versus for yeah. symptomatic COVID patients versus yeah. other coughs or things like, uh, um, you know, smart image analysis of hundreds of uh, CT lung scans, right, to diagnose to yeah. diagnose COVID as well, and developing those algorithms. Uh, this area, sort of, of machine diagnosis, I think, is going to be really important in the future. But I do want to highlight that it's, you know, there, the 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 scope for where technology can go now post COVID is is phenomenal. But what's happened is also very remarkable. If you think about, you know, a number of vaccines, novel vaccines, right, being developed in. Uh, under a year, as in developed, uh, uh, designed, authorized mm -hmm. for use in under a year, where the industry average is, you know, just under 10 years, about around 8.2, uh, for new drug development is, is a feat in and of itself, and I think will set the stage for, for how we innovate moving forward. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. I actually liked what you mentioned about, you know, using AI technology for, to detect exact symptoms like a cough. Um, like, you know, just maybe a small anecdote whenever we're like in a packed area and if my wife hears someone cough, she already thinks, oh gosh, do they have COVID? Yeah. But it's like, I say, well, TB is cough as well. The other diseases that come from coughs or flus. So it'd be good that obviously there will be a way that that can be detected, but obviously not something that will be um, invasive where you're like on a underground and someone coughs and then there's a speaker, oh, passenger X. Um, has just coughed and has COVID, please depart the trade or something like that. <laughs> so, but I think I'm, that's, that's fascinating, this technology like that, I think that would be really fanta fantastic. Because one of the things, of course, is you know that why um, COVID spread so fast, because people were not able to detect it early enough, especially epidemiologists were not on, on point there. They didn't have enough, a lot of countries don't actually have, actually have enough epidemiologists to detect things like that. So faster diagnosis, I think, would be fantastic. Um, I think I've heard about a company that's looking at, even for TB, trying to bring it down to about, I think, a couple of hours. One of the reasons why TB spreads so fast, as you know, is because sometimes in some rural areas, it takes about a week to, to detect whether someone has that. And by that time, they've gone back to the village, they've coughed on everybody, and sadly, yeah. maybe some people might have passed away from that. Um, so, Joe, just did you want me to repeat that question that I asked everyone? No, I think I, I remember the question. And, okay, uh, all right. And I think if I got it right, it's, it's also talking about what are the things that we have, sort of the old school types of innovations that we've had at our disposal that maybe we haven't used, utilized uh, as much. I mean, one of the things that I think should be mentioned is the WHO. We need the WHO to continue to be a strong body that provides that normative guidance and that sort of independent arbiter yeah. uh, that can help in, in a time like this. Uh, I don't think it's wise to, to reinvent something, but uh, I think there is a recognized need, even as problematic it was early in the epidemic, um, about their, the WHO's role. So I think that, that should be there. I think uh, continuing to support global health R&D, uh, thank goodness SEPI existed. If it, you know, it didn't exist, we'd have to recreate it, but I think uh, we have an important year coming up uh, in 2022 with SEPI going for replenishment. We need all governments uh, following the example of Saudi Arabia to, to reinvest so that we can continue to uh, make sure that the world's better prepared. I, I like the points about the vaccine manufacturing side as well. In addition to that, I think tech transfer, we've seen a lot uh, in the way of companies uh, lending some of the, their expertise to other capable manufacturing uh, facilities to make sure that uh, we had a more aggressive um, manufacturing plan for, for some of the vaccines that, that came out. And it's good to see announcements with Moderna, BioNTech just today about expanding uh, some of those vaccine production facilities on the continent of Africa so that we're not just talking about high-income countries. Um, I also think that uh, it's important now, to, as, as we think about the, this current pandemic, this race on the discovery and you know all the great uh, innovations that came out of that, then the procurement challenge that we've had, and it remains a huge challenge this year. Soon, I think we're quickly going to be in a stage where it's all about delivery of, of vaccines in low-income countries. 
uh, and, and also addressing the, the demand and some of the resistance that we may find. So how do we also just make sure that on the delivery side, some of the same great innovations and, and you know, uh, creative thinking that went into the discovery, we also uh, can apply to, to delivery. Um, and, and likewise, on the behavior acceptance, uh, making sure that we also invest in, in uh, uh, reaching people and, and educating people about uh, the importance of these vaccines as part of an overall public health strategy. Next year will be really important too to just re-emphasize the importance of strong public health systems. And it's, it's uh, I think, one of the best ways that we can really just make sure that um, everywhere we've got better systems that can take advantage of the ability that um, we have with better surveillance, better sequencing to, to detect and, and address some uh, emerging threats. So just some of the things that I think exist and, and some of the things where I think that uh, we're gonna need to strengthen uh, uh, you know, future aspects of our, of our uh, global public health system. Thanks a lot, Joe. I really like the point you mentioned about investment in education, especially just, you know, like I remember, former colleague I used to work with, she was at the forefront of the Ebola virus, and one of the things she mentioned is that they basically had to deploy the army just to force local populations just to do for basic hygiene. And that was one of the ways they actually stopped the Ebola virus um, getting worse than it was in Sierra Leone. So I think that concept of uh, investment in education, just I think a lot of people are now very sensitive about hygiene. You know, it's very rare for you to shake people's hands now. So, um, so I think one of the things, just you know, investing in education and health would be very, very important. I'm very conscious that we only have about one minute left. So what I would do, I'm not going to go into other questions, but I just want to see if there was any um, like parting shots from the panel on in, in, in terms of where we should focus in terms of technology or collaboration. So I'll probably start off first of all with you, Frederick. Mm. Well, thanks for the great comments, and I think I, I would like to summarize it in four points. I mean, I think we've heard we need, you know, better political leadership and governance and coordination. Uh, we need financing ready to go, um, you know, consistent financing in the inter-pandemic periods, but also surge financing. We need uh, to think end-to-end, -end, all the way from predictions to surveillance, to R&D for medical countermeasures, to delivery. And fourth, and not least, we need a paradigm of thinking equitable access. You know, how can we get this out to the whole world? Um, I think science has paved the way out of this pandemic uh, and will pave the way out of the next one as well. But we need to you know, make sure that we have the vision and the cooperation mm -hmm that the benefits of science can actually be achieved for all. Yeah, thanks. Sarah? Uh, so, thanks also for, for a fantastic conversation. Um, I, would, I would sum it up by just saying that, uh, you know, I think we, we've witnessed, again, as a, as a consequence of COVID, what folks have dubbed the great biotech acceleration. So, so I'm very excited about what the future holds for the sector. I think some lessons learned are, of course, investing in these reimagined public health systems that we've been talking about today. Um, you know, stronger uh, collaborations and partnerships. Um, I think innovating in spaces where we can collapse and condense timelines like clinical trials and, and detection methods. Uh, I think also uh, better integration of digital technologies and making sure that we have the right IT infrastructure and the quality of data that allows for sort of cloud-based interoperable data sharing uh, uh, in, in, of course, a safe and ethical way. Um, but I also think, you know, the fundamentals like building talent is, is of, of prime importance for us as, as, as a kingdom. Uh, uh, and we understand that, that talent and human capital is really the, the bedrock of, okay. of this sector. Um, and, and then, of course, handling complexity, right? So we've, we've uh, had to rethink uh, supply chains yeah. uh, and understand how we can facilitate quick scale-up of, of new biologics. And then finally, of course, improving uh, 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 commercial uh, and development processes. So, so a renaissance in R&D of infectious diseases. Thanks a lot. So I've been told that we need to end, so maybe I'll just give you like maybe 10, 10 seconds, Nathan. Uh, 10 <laughs> seconds. Um, I think a shared language, a shared language, and it's related to a common IT infrastructure. To enable WHO, WHO has a critical role, 
next generation monitoring has a critical role, modeling has a fundamental role, but we need the capacity to make, to permit WHO to be able to speak in the same language as a vaccine manufacturer, as a local health, local health organization, and frankly, and I'll leave this perhaps with this crowd, is to financial institutions. So financial institutions, industry, corporations are holding tremendous risk. They need access to these same tools to de-risk our common, you know, all features of our society. This really is a systemic risk like climate, and it needs to be addressed in such a way that, that addresses all these different features. All right. So thanks so much for my plan. You've been fantastic. Actually, I was writing here because I actually was learning a lot from you guys. So this is actually my notes. Um, not to ask you more questions, but to say, wow, I've got some really good tips here moving forward, and hopefully put this into some kind of paper and share that with the world. So thanks so much to my panel, and I wish you all the best and success and safe journey back to your countries. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.